college. I was just about to graduate. I went to the job board. You know, everybody does. Back then, you know, it wasn't even the newspaper for me. It was little three by five cards on a on a board with little thumb pins in them. You know, and, and I saw that listing, and I also applied to Hughes and TRW, and interviewed at all three places. I got offers from TRW and from Mattel. And uh, you know, when I interviewed, I actually brought this uh, electronic thing that I had built. I think they thought that was completely insane. I built this little handheld uh, digital time tester thing, complete with batteries and two circuit boards that I had hand etched myself, a little fold over thing that connected the two, and insulation between them, and LED displays the whole bit. So I was a complete turbo nerd already. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can we say? He's a geek. So. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, geeky before it was cool.
Plug, plug, plug. So we'll have a chance. They, they actually all throw all the GameCube version also, and I think that, uh, well, no, no, I don't think uh, Blowout is. I think this is the first time that all three of them have been on any, that, that Blowout may have never been seen before. Now that I think of it. Okay, Phil. Um, still playing games? Yeah. Other than Burger Time and getting the high score? Uh, yeah, aside from Burger Time, uh, you know, I'll, I'll mention one thing about Burger Time because that, that was kind of fun. I mean, having a Burger Time machine in the office was awesome. The biggest problem is that I and a couple of the other people were seriously hooked on that game. Um, we did get to the point where, uh, unfortunately, I can't do it anymore. The score I got in the back there was only 119,000. We used to routinely get over a million points in Burger Time. And because we figured out patterns on every one of the levels, we could drop all the guys on every bunt on every level just about. Not quite, but it was, it was to the point where it became ludicrous and we actually wrapped around the score count on it. Um, what I'm playing now is uh, my wife and I just finished playing some Rock Band and are looking looking forward to getting Rock Band 2 and working through that. Uh, it's I try not to play too many games. I deliberately have not gotten into World of Warcraft because I know I've never come up again. <laughs> and, uh, and I do have a job and that kind of life to have. But uh, that's what I'm playing right now. That was a lot of fun. I really had a great time with Rock Band. <laughs> and, and by the way, his job now is he's the president of a game development company, so yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that too. I mean, <laughs> new games were a little so You're playing video games, games all day anyway. The other games I play are the ones that we make. And uh, looking back at Mattel, what do you realize now you didn't realize then about the job? Well, I think the other folks have really said it. I mean, it is one of those cases where it was the greatest job in the world and you couldn't believe you did it. I mean, where else are you going to be right out of college? I mean, I was a year out of college, and my boss walks up to me and says, Hey, Bill, interested in going to Taiwan? <laughs> I said, Why? He says, Well, you know, if you're not interested, I can always get somebody else. I said, No, I'm interested. Just tell me what the deal is. He says, But we're starting up a company in, uh, in, in Taipei to do Apple II and IBM PC programming, and uh, you know, I'd like you to go out there and hire the staff and train them and spend the summer in Taiwan. I'm like, are you sure? Okay. <laughs> Rock on. So, you know, here I was, you know, 25 years old, and flying to Taiwan and training all staff of programs, hiring Chinese programmers to do Apple II. They had no idea what was going on. I mean, it was, it was huge culture shock. And so, I mean, where else are you going to have an experience like that? It's the once in a lifetime kind of thing. And it was a blast. And, uh, you know, so we got to do stuff like that. And then the other guys are right, too, that the environment there was very fluid and very free, and it wasn't like most jobs. And, and so what I did actually is once we left there, you know, Mike and Steve and I started a company. Um, and, and I've perpetuated that same kind of feeling. It's interesting because when people walk into our office, all they do is they walk into the lobby. I mean, they don't even walk around the office. They walk in and say, wow, this must be a really cool place to work. I'd like to work here. And it's because we, have, I've kept that same vibe. It's the only job I've ever had. So I try to keep that same vibe, a very open, fluid kind of working environment where people are respected for what they do and they can do great things. They can screw around sometimes and come up with great ideas. Management doesn't tell them to shove it because we weren't planning on doing that. You know, and uh, I, I certainly hope that that's what's going to come out of this learning. But you know, that was the thing that, that was great about Mattel is you just felt so enthusiastic about being there. It was like, wow, we're doing stuff that nobody's ever done before. And we're doing things that, uh, that, that we just enjoy. So you go there every day and you're, wow, this is a really cool challenge. I'm going to beat this thing. So. Dave Warhol, how did you learn about the job? Uh, let's see, I learned about the job. I, was, uh, I went to Pomona College, uh, got a degree in music, uh, theory, composition, and then I got a job with the college for a year uh, in our computer center. And during that year, um, I got a, um, a message from a guy named Don Daglow, who also went to Pomona College, and he had asked the computer center to post on their bulletin board, hey, we're hiring at Mattel. And I went, post it on the bulletin board, forget it. I'm going to respond to this myself. <laughs> so uh, we did post it as well, and Eddie Dombrower uh, was also another classmate of ours. Um, we heard about the position and joined up. So, uh, so uh, I went in and did the interviews, uh, and uh, first I interviewed with Mike, and he had a technical, um, he had a technical quiz for me that I probably barely passed. And then I had another interview with Don, and he said, "Well, you have to talk to Mike first because of the home court advantage or whatever." And then my last, my last interview was with Gabriel, and for five minutes we talked about my qualifications. Ten minutes we talked about 
what it was like to work at Mattel and for a half hour we talked about the symphony in Europe from eight, 1920 to 1950 or something like that. Uh, kind of told me that they were trying to bring in people with diverse backgrounds and interests uh, uh, into the mix there. And your favorite in television game and why? Well, I got, like Mike, I guess I got a lot of favorites. Uh, uh, I like to play uh, Deadly Discs. That's, that's just a lot of finesse with the two game controllers and all that. But a lot of the later uh, in, INTV Corporation games I like uh, for the gameplay, but also because, you know, being on the inside of them, there were tricks that we were doing that I was really proud of. Hover Force had an, uh, a little enemy helicopter AI interpreter language where we could script up different ways that the enemies behaved and, and we cramped 99 holes of golf into the Super Pro Golf and, and uh, Body Slam I loved, uh, just coming up with inside jokes for the characters' names and things like that. So there's, there's a ton of them that a lot of pride in. What was the, the, you're talking about the helicopter, what was the one helicopter you really liked? Oh, well, we had a, oh. <laughs> All right, Hover Force is this big city, uh, metropolitan area, and the helicopters are flying around, blowing up the city, and you have to kind of figure out what, how they're moving and anticipate them and, and get them. And one of the, uh, probably 18 different helicopter styles, and one of them was called I Hate Hoops. And all it did was fly around the city looking for basketball courts, and as soon as it found a basketball court, it would just humble the city. And after a while, it would find another basketball court and hammer that. Yeah, you did. You produced a lot of games, probably more than anybody else. Um, what have you not? What were you not able to do? What would you like to have done? Uh, the um, uh, in the waiting side of the Intellivision uh, was right, right when the uh, 8-bit Nintendo was coming up, and and uh, so I, looking back, I would have loved to do a side scroller, a Super Mario Brothers thing. At, at Real Time Associates, we ended up doing probably two dozen side scrollers on different consoles, but uh, we never really. Uh, had the chance to do one on the in television, and had pitched the guys at INTV Corporation a couple of original ideas. One was kind of a, a robot wars kind of game, where you try to get into a robot factory that had been um, uh, gone haywire, run amok, and, and all, cranking out all these robots, and that you were trying to break into. But back then, uh, they couldn't sell anything without a license. There weren't really, it, it's, if you look at console cycles, at the beginning part of a console, It'll have a lot of original software, but at the end of it, it's got a lot of licenses to kind of cut through the noise. And, and so there were a couple of ideas like that that I couldn't get off the ground because they were, I don't know, original. And uh, you playing games now? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I am playing World of Warcraft. I got an 80 Warlock on one of those servers and a few other characters. Um, I keep an eye, because I still am in game development, I do keep an eye on a lot of games. Uh, pick up all the big ones and get, you know, 80 plus. Um, uh, God of War. I've just picked up StarCraft recently, um, and uh, but I'm, I'm only half playing them. I, I play them to enjoy them half the time. The other half, I'm reverse engineering and going, oh, that's interesting what they did with the HUD there, or how did they get that special effect, or I haven't seen that before. So it's always kind of keeping an eye I am a competitive product while at the same point in time just you know trying to get some fun out of them as well. You're looking at some of the Facebook games too, aren't you? What's that? Didn't you say you looked at some of the Facebook games? Oh yeah, too? Facebook. Well, I'm, uh, I, I may be, uh, I, I may get to do a Facebook game for, for a company, we'll see. Uh, but I'm playing a lot of Frontierville and Social City and Treasure Isle and stuff like that. Again, trying to uh, just see what the mechanics are there in common and, and what they're doing. And uh, looking back at the Mattel, what do you know now about the experience that you didn't realize at the time? Well, I know I should have a better answer to this because this is a question that I came up with. <laughs> but, uh, but I think at the time I recognized how fun and unique it, would, it was working there and that how few people had the opportunity to do that. And uh, like Bill, I've tried to take some of those uh, experiences and perpetuate them into, into my own company. Uh, but uh, uh, no, I guess, uh, I guess I'm kind of figuring out that what I, I didn't realize at the time how unique either the technologies or the, the, the designs or, you know, we're kind of like working at the subatomic level of game design and now it's, it's you know, molecules, entire, you know, massive constructs made out of all of these little things that we started off with, you know, doing eight lines of code. It's like, wow, that's the best random number generator I've ever seen. And then, you know, now it's, that's just a, a footnote or an afterthought in somebody else's library of the high 